Okay, today we are talking about virtue ethics. I'm going to get into that a little bit, but it of course is the third of the uh, general approaches to doing uh, ethics. The first one which we looked at on the 22nd of October is teleology or goal ethics. Then last week we looked at deontology or duty ethics, and today we're going to talk about erythiology or virtue ethics. Um, I, of course, I use this every time because it's the whole point. Ethics or moral philosophy, as you call it if you're looking at it as an academic discipline, is the branch of philosophy that simply helps us answer the questions, what's the best way for people to live, or more specifically in day-to-day, -day, um, what actions are right or wrong in particular circumstances? How do we make good moral decisions, which is why it's called moral philosophy. Um, in very practical sense, moral philosophy or ethics helps us by defining concepts like good and evil. What is good, what is evil, and what is more good. You know, one of the challenges we always have is we say we want to do what's best. Well, how do you know what's best? Uh, what is right and wrong? What is virtue versus vice? What is cr crime and what is justice? Ethics helps us uh, discuss and determine those questions. And not everybody agrees. And one of the things that, that causes some disagreement is the fact there are different ways to go about this. The issue in, in ethics and in moral philosophy is not just what do I believe, I mean, we as Christians could probably be pretty clear on that, but based upon that, what should I do? How do I act? How do I make decisions about what's moral and what's not? Um, Christian ethics interacts with other kinds of ethics, uh, historical ethics, but all, whether Christian, Jewish, um, secular ethics, ethics based upon the ancient Greek philosophers or whatever, all of them basically take one or some combination of three basic approaches. I mentioned them already. There is teleology or goal-oriented ethics. What is it we want to try to accomplish? And you make moral decisions based upon that. There's various parts of that or various uh, manifestations of that. Things like um, teleology is sometimes called consequentialism because conse the, the issue of making a moral decision is you're making the moral decision based upon what you believe the consequences are going to be. So consequential, uh, consequentialism or goal-oriented ethic, uh, ethical decisions are tele teleology. You then have duty or rule-oriented, where you say there is some rule that I'm supposed to follow. That's obvious in terms of secular law. You know, the, the government will tell you what duties you have, what laws or rules you must obey. But it's larger than that. The ontology can deal with things like uh, religious ethical systems. The Jewish law, for instance, is an example of that. Um, or it could be simply what we have as kind of our own internal sense of duty. What do we believe we ought to do? What, you know, what's, um, what's the right thing for me to do? Now that's different than virtue. We're going to talk about today. Virtue ethics asks what kind of person should I be? But what should I do? What's the right thing for me to do? And people have an inherent kind of compass on that. In fact, a good, that's a good illustration of what we've talked about in the apologetics class. One of the great challenges for the new, agnostic, the new atheists, excuse me, is to try to explain where, where it is that all humans seem to have some almost universally consistent idea that some things are right and some things are wrong. Where does that moral sense come from if there is no God, right? So all people do have some moral sense. No matter what, and you may say there's gray areas, like cannibals say it's okay to eat people, but none of them think it's okay to eat their own kids. You know, it's okay to eat the other guy's kids, you know, the other tribe's kids, but not your next door neighbor. Um, but still, no, there's no culture that thinks that it's really, um, it's a good idea to always lie about things. You know, there's, a, there's an inherent sense that we need to tell the truth. <clears throat> now, there, there are some cultures, and I've actually run into some modern cultures like that, that believe that that a higher priority is to um, make somebody feel comfortable. And if you have to lie to them in order to make them feel comfortable or to tell them what they want to hear, there's some African cultures like that. And I, I learned that in, and some of that may be in Mexico as well, that the idea is you don't want to offend people. And offending people is a greater crime than not telling the truth. And, but still, all other things being equal, telling the truth is, uh, is a universal sense um, of doing the right thing, some sense of respecting human life at least human life that's close to you, etc. So there are rules uh, or duties. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about the third kind of ethics, which is eretiology or virtue-oriented ethics. 
Teleology and deontology are the words that are commonly used for goal ethics and duty ethics. They don't often as, uh, as often use aretiology. People seem to stumble over that one more for some reason. It comes from the Greek word aretes, which means virtue. And so it is virtue ethics. And we want to talk about that one today. Um, any questions about that? Are we good so far? We're clear where we are. We've talked about this stuff before, but I, I always feel every week I need to kind of give a foundational layer for us to be able to move on. So in aretiology, the question is, what makes a good person? It is not so much about how we make a good moral decision, but what does it mean to be a good moral person? Aretiological or virtue ethics emphasize the role of one's character and the virtues that one's character embodies for determining or evaluating ethical behavior. The idea here, and this goes all the way back, I'm going to talk about the history in a minute, <clears throat> all the way back to the Greek philosophers, um, a, a little bit with Socrates, a little bit with Plato, and especially with Aristotle, those three primaries that were three generations of philosophers. Socrates was Plato's teacher, Plato was Aristotle's teacher. <clears throat> but um, all of them dealt with virtue ethics primarily, and that is, what does it mean to be a good person? And the idea there is if you are a good person, if you are a person that has developed virtue in yourself, moral virtues as part of your character, and that doesn't mean that in any given circumstance you'll do the right thing. It means that you have become a person of character. And so it's a development process. It has to do with who and what you are, not just what decisions you make. In fact, one of the things, and you'll see that on the study notes, Ancient um, ethical theory, especially from the ancient Greeks, had to do with agent-centered ethics, meaning, what am I as a person? Modern ethics, which is primarily teleological and deontological, is action-centered ethics, meaning it's not focused on, on my character and me being a virtuous person. It's based entirely upon what decisions do I make and how do I act. So there's a fundamental difference uh, between Virtue ethics, which focuses on the individual who's making the, the, the ethical decisions, and the actual action of what they do. If you never had to make an ethical decision in your whole life, you still could be a moral person and would fulfill the expectations of a virtue ethics. Make sense? So, we can say that virtue ethics is a classification within normative ethics. You will remember there's three big categories. There's meta-ethics, which is like the high-level 30,000-foot philosophy. Why do we believe certain things are good and certain things are bad? It asks the big philosophical questions that are not nearly as practical. Then there is normative ethics, the second level, which has to do with the systems by which we can make moral decisions, particularly teleology, deontology, and aretiology. And then there's, there is the, the very practical ethics where how do we make a, a specific decision? How do I decide whether or not, you know, it's okay for me to defend my, myself against this person even if it means doing violence? That's the, the, the practical level. But the middle one, the normative ethics, is where we look at the systems that are supposed to guide us toward making those decisions. <clears throat> Virtue ethics, along with teleology and deontology, are one of the classifications within normative ethics that attempts to discover and classify what is deemed as moral character. What does it mean to be a person with moral character? And then you get to the application of that. If I become a moral person, then that will work its way out in terms of how I make moral decisions. So you see the difference between teleology and deontology that are action-oriented and virtue ethics, which is, as they say, agent-oriented. It's focused on the person. And you could have good virtue ethics without ever having to make a serious moral uh, decision, although that's not possible, because as we said when we started the class, everyone has to make moral decisions all the time. You know, is it, is it wrong for me to wear blue, <coughs> blue and green together? You know, is it, uh, the, some people have a moral decision, um, you know, <laughs> that, fashion questions. Um, but so everyone has to make these decisions, but aretheology, is, in, is the third of these classifications within normative ethics by which we can hopefully be guided in, in our decision making. Um, I could go into more description, sort of rehearsing again, what 
we talked about in deontology and teleology, I don't think you need that to, to see the difference. So, aridiology again, what makes a good person? As I said, this uh, comes primarily from the ancient Greek philosophers. It has carried on, I'm going to talk about the history of aridiology in a few minutes. Um, the key concepts in virtue ethics come from the ancient Greeks, and those concepts, there are three primary concepts within virtue ethics. One is arete, which means excellence or virtue. It's translated. That's where we get the technical name in philosophy of aretiology. The second is phronesis. Phronesis means practical or moral wisdom. If you become a moral person, if you become a virtuous person, then along with developing those virtues in yourself, and, and it, it's not just, as I said earlier, and it's, it gets a little complicated in the Greek philosophers, because it's not just a matter of developing honesty. It's a matter of becoming an honest person. Do you see the difference? It doesn't just mean that you have a practice of doing honest things. It means that your character is of being an honest person, or a courageous person, or a prudent person, or a discipline, you know, a, a temperate person, a disciplined person. So it's not just that you have these, uh, these principles that you, you try to apply, it's who you are. And so phronesis, or practical or moral wisdom, is what you then have if you become that kind of moral person. If you become the moral person, you develop uh, along with that the phronesis or the moral wisdom, and that allows you then to do moral decision making. See the difference? So. Virtue ethics is, is almost two steps removed from what teleology and deontology works with. Because first, it's, it's to become a moral person. Then, as part of that process, you develop moral wisdom. And then you can make decisions about actions. Teleology and deontology go straight to the actions and say, based upon what do we make these decisions? Okay. And the third, which we've talked about before, is eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is, was a major theme in Aristotle. It means flourishing, sometimes translated happiness. It means human well-being. It's the accomplishment of a, the best possible state of human life. And it involves excelling at the things that you do as well as being a virtuous person. But the idea in Aristotle is that the way to accomplish uh, eudaimonia to accomplish flourishing or happiness is to develop yourself into being a virtuous person. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like, okay, I've got this list of rules, I'm going to post them in my cubicle, and I'm always going to do these things. It has to do with who you are. All right? So in that way, it's, it's more difficult than teleology and deontology. And it really is seen as a lifetime process. The Greek philosophers felt like it is the primary responsibility of, of every person and the primary goal of philosophy to develop a virtuous character, to have the virtues as part of who you are. And it takes time. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit later about moral education. Training in morality has been something that historically is fundamental to virtue ethics. And the Greeks advocated that. They thought the primary goal of education was to teach philosophy, and the primary goal of philosophy was to create character, moral character in people. All right? Now, it's important to note that while they are different, virtue theology is not in conflict with deontology and teleology. It's not like you have to go, okay, this or this or this. In fact, next week I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that I think Jesus as a model is someone who reflects all three of these. So they're not in conflict, but again, teleology and deontology are focused entirely upon the actions a person should take, whereas um, the virtue ethics, aretheology, has to do with what the moral, uh, what a moral person is, the moral uh, virtues that are desirable in a person that will then help them make the moral actions. But they're not in conflict with one another. It'd be possible for someone to pursue virtue ethics, that is, to try to become a moral character, to have a moral character in themselves, and at the same time believe that there are certain rules that we should follow, deontology, and that we have to be concerned about making, uh, of doing the best result for the greatest number of people, which is consequentialism. It is trying to look at the end results of our decisions. You can apply all three of these. They're not contradictory to one another. In fact, one of the things I'm going to argue later is that some people have said virtue ethics isn't, isn't actually any different 
than deontology or teleology. <laughs> that it may be, it may, you may actually be able to assume it, but I'll get into that conversation a little bit. Again, virtue ethics focuses on being versus doing. Morality stems from the character of the actor rather than being a reflection of the actions. Now, um, all of these three types, um, deontology, teleology, and virtue ethics, all ultimately hope to reach the place where it gives us guidance on how we can make moral decisions. But even, but they differ in some ways, and even within virtue ethics, there are different sort of schools. There are different ways of approaching it. Plato's ideas are not actually the same as Aristotle's. Even though Plato was Aristotle's teacher and he developed that in him, um, as we look at the history a little bit later, we can see that there have been different kinds of developments in this, and as we look into the future, there are new kinds of virtue ethics being done just in the last 20 years, well, actually the last 10 years, that are quite different than Aristotelian ethics, which everything else is all, virtue ethics has always been based on Aristotle until quite recently. And so we're now coming up with different kinds of ideas as to what virtue ethics can be. Um, it's, it's valuable, too, to understand that within virtue ethics, according to Aristotle, and those who, and that's almost all virtue ethicists up until recently, those who follow Aristotle draw a distinction between um, what Aristotle called full or perfect virtue, where you are, you are virtue, it is your character, it is, it's who you are, versus what Aristotle called continence, <laughs> um, great word, continence, you know, meaning as we get older, we realize that means don't wet on yourself. But continence, in the case of Aristotle, meant that even though you may not have the level of embedded moral character that is ideal, you still are at some point along the way of having strength of will so that you can try to manifest moral virtues. You get the difference? That, a, that the truly virtuous person, you know, the person who has a complete a full or perfect virtue would be like um, like Lancelot in the, that just popped into my head in the in the Arthur legends where he's pure and right and strong and good and it's who he is right up until the time that he commits adultery with Guinevere but uh, that that's who he is well the other knights of the round table may not have been so much uh, embedded with this inherent full moral virtue but they still went out and, and tried to manifest strength and courage and, you know, and honesty and, and protecting the weak and all these sort of virtuous characters. So they were, they were performing continence. They were using their strength of will to try to manifest moral character, even though they may not have, had, have been so embedded in it that it's who they are. All right? And that difference, it's important because it, in, in the Greek philosophers and others since then, if you only look at the full strength of moral character, that would take you a lifetime to accomplish and you may never feel like you've arrived. Well, does that mean that you don't have to actually uh, show forth any moral virtues in your life? Obviously not. Once we've identified what, what moral virtues are, we all have a responsibility to do them as best we can. That is part of virtue ethics. But that is an act of continence, an act of using our strength of will to try to accomplish these things, even if we've not yet arrived to where this is who we are. I mean, Jesus is a perfect, perfect example of somebody who was a moral character. You know, he, he, he was tempted in all ways, even as we are, and yet was without sin. No better definition for what it means to be a completely moral character. But then you get other people like, like St. Paul, who was not morally perfect. In fact, Paul calls himself the worst of sinners. You know, Paul, Paul admitted that he had, was not perfect, and yet, after he became a believer, after he was uh, experienced the risen Christ, he exercised great strength of will in order to, to, to live out the moral characters that he knew that God wanted him to have. So there you see difference, and it's important because how we apply this stuff varies depending upon where we are in the development of our moral character. Um, another way that we can, uh, well, related to how we might fall short of a full <coughs> virtue is that we might, we might have been developing virtuous character, but we might yet not have a well-developed phronesis or moral or practical wisdom. And that comes from experience. 
phronesis, moral wisdom, is a combination of having the moral character itself, but then having enough world life experience to be able to figure out how our moral character gets applied in the world. Because phronesis, the moral wisdom, has to do with how we apply our moral virtue that we've developed to real life situations. And so that's why it's called practical wisdom, um, phronesis. It is a, an application, a practice of those things. And that ability to do that well only comes with life experience. Which is why uh, the philosophers, the ancient philosophers, especially Aristotle, said that this is a lifetime pursuit. Because even if you've achieved moral character, to be able to manifest that with phronesis, practical wisdom, you have to have practical experience in order to be able to understand the application of practical experience. So that was was much of where we came from. Now, I want to, now Marvin. And knowledge and understanding. There's many things we don't know and we'll act according to what we know. And then also understanding, understanding. And that's why the young people tend to be very white or wrong, black or white. And as you get older, you get more wishy-washy and gray and uncertain yeah. because it's not just black and white. Right. Because I think that's right. Because the, the longer you live, the more you realize that there are a lot more categories of things than you realize. You know, you've had a lot more opportunities to see life experience and say, man, it's harder than just it is or it isn't. It's black or it's white, it's right or it's wrong. There are areas where you have to struggle with it sometimes. That's the whole point of ethics, is the fact that it's not, it was always obvious, we just write it all down and hand it out. But the idea is how do we develop the ability to do that? Well, the older we get, the more practical life experience we have, the more we realize that there are circumstances in which that making that decision are especially hard. And that, as we experience that, we develop phronesis, we develop practical wisdom in how we apply virtue. Yes? Well, especially when you're working with other people and you say, why, why did he do that? And if you can get a little bit more understanding, you can recognize that they are working the best they can with their knowledge and that understanding. So rather than be too quick to say, that's bad, maybe it's not good, but it's not necessarily bad either. Yeah. Um, and, and you develop with practical life experience, you develop some kind of principles of your own. One of the principles I've learned to be true in evaluating other, pe other people's, and even my sort of ethical decision making, is that self-justification is a powerful motivator. Okay. Um, I had somebody who worked for me as an account executive and she had a client who was doing the, had done some awful things, but they did it and I realized immediately because they had done some, the first stupid thing they did, they then spent the whole time trying to figure out how to justify that, and then it just compounded the problem. Because self-justification is, is a powerful motivation. Um, the other principle that I taught this particular worker at this time was people are weird. <coughs> human beings, as we say in the South, human beings are the funniest people in the whole world. So as we have more practical life experience and develop more phron phronesis, we begin to understand that it's more complicated than that. People are not that simple. It's not black and white, because people are not black and white. I think it's helpful for us to understand a little bit about the historical development of virtue ethics or ideology. So I want to go through uh, some of that now so you have some sense. And then I'm going to get into the development uh, or the <laughs> principles of the, vir of the cardinal virtues. First, uh, ethics, virtue ethics, pretty much started. Socrates talked about being a good person. In fact, Socrates was so concerned about being a, an ethically moral person that he had an option of not committing suicide. But he thought it was more virtuous for him to go along with the penalties the court had applied and to make a point. <laughs> and so he drank the hemlock. But he didn't write, uh, Socrates didn't write anything. Socrates didn't believe in writing. Plato articulated Socrates' viewpoints, his teacher, as well as then his own. So in Plato's Republic, he discusses at some length the four cardinal virtues. I'm going to talk about the four cardinal virtues shortly. They make up, they're four of the seven of what are considered the cardinal virtues of the Christian faith now. And so that hasn't changed. I mean, since, since three, before 300 B.C., there has been fairly universal acceptance that there are four cardinal virtues. And cardinal literally means hinge. They're the hinge virtues or cardinal virtues because they're the ones that actually allow us to um, implement or control or reflect on the other virtues. It's not like there are only four virtues. We'll get into that. 
Aristotle comes along, and his whole moral theory is pretty much focused on the virtues and on achieving um, the eudaimonia, which is happiness or flourishing or well-being, as we said. So he says that's our goal. Everybody wants that. Um, and Aristotle goes at some length in order to describe the fact that any, any other goal that human beings might have is actually just an attempt to get at something else. So he worked through the, the process of trying to figure out what is the ultimate, what is the real goal that everyone has, and that is to be happy, to flourish, to have well-being. And so that's the focus point, that's the end goal. That's not, everything else may be a process to get there. People say, well, I want power. Well, why? Power by itself doesn't get anything. I want money. Money by itself is useless. What are you really looking for? And so Aristotle developed this idea that it was eudaimonia, that is happiness, that is well-being. That's what they really want. They think, unfortunately most people aren't even aware enough to think this, but we, we, most human beings think, if I get wealth, if I get good relationships, if I get power, if I get, you know, whatever else it might be, health, that will give me well-being or flourishing or happiness. And so Aristotle said that's really the thing everybody's looking for, whether they named it or not. And that the way to do that is through really the practicing of the virtues, especially the four cardinal virtues, which we'll talk about. So Aristotle really articulated that somewhat differently than Plato did, but Plato started with the four cardinal, cardinal virtues. Um, then virtue theory, we're talking historically here, was is found and was carried over into the histories of the Roman historians. Again, it started in Greece, but then Rome conquered all of the Mediterranean basin and conquered the Greeks, and they absorbed the Greek philosophy. Because even though the Romans were great builders and they were great conquerors, they looked to the Greeks for more of the academic side of things. You know, they even absorbed their gods. But the Greek philosophy and the Greek language even became huge things in the Roman culture. And so um, Livy, Plutarch, and Tacitus are three of the Roman historians that lived in the first to second century AD. And they focused a lot on the idea of virtue theory as found in the Greek philosophers. Now, when we say virtue ethics versus virtue theory, it, you don't need to get wound up in why I'm using those different terms. Virtue theory is more theoretical. It has to do with sort of taking a step back and considering what virtue is and how it gets applied and you know, whereas virtue ethics means actually becoming an ethical person. You know, it's beginning to, to say what is the process by which I become a virtuous person. So I'll use virtue theory, which means when they're talking more theoretically, more abstractly about the virtues, we refer to virtue theory. When they're talking about how it actually gets, gets to becoming a virtuous person, the practical side of that, then we talk about virtue ethics, okay? And as in all philosophy, sometimes they, they, they strain at gnats on this stuff. But virtue theory and virtue ethics, whole, whole books have been written about the difference between those two. Then we have Cicero, or if you want to pronounce it accurately in Latin, it would be Cicero. Um, Cicero, in the second century AD, brought virtue theory into Roman philosophy. Again, the earlier guys, um, Livy, Plutarch, and Tacitus, talked about it from a historical point of view. Um, Cicero, Cicero, I'll use Cicero because people are more comfortable with that, even though that's not the way the Latins, or the Greeks, as a matter of fact, pronounced it. That's just the way we do it now. Um, Cicero actually began to write Roman philosophy using the Greek concepts of the virtues, virtue theory. Then, importantly, in the 4th century, St. Ambrose of Milan, one of the early uh, bishops of that part of Europe, incorporated virtue theory into Christian theology. He began to say, what, what can we learn from the virtue theory of the Greeks? That is, the application of the cardinal virtues. How does that jive with, how can that be combined with, how is that consistent with what we believe as Christians about Christian ethic and the Christian faith? I'll talk about that in a few minutes when I talk about the virtues. Then, St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas pretty much did everything. If you want, if any topic that comes up in Christian theology or Christian philosophy or Christian history, look up uh, Aquinas, uh, look up St. Thomas Aquinas, and look up St. Augustine. And between the two of them, they covered everything. Right? Um, Augustine being around 400 and a little bit later, and Thomas Aquinas being in the 13th century. But between them, 
and, and they didn't always agree on stuff, that's why I say between them. The, um, Augustine and Aquinas actually sort of be, began modeling two different approaches to philosophy, and Aquinas became the, cat, the Catholic theologian. He is the divine doctor of, of Catholic theology. Um, when the Protestants came along, they didn't agree with what Aquinas had said. They didn't believe with natural law, for instance, because they thought human beings were fallen and were too sinful. We don't have enough rationality for natural law to give us the ability to decide what's right and wrong or to, as fallen creatures. So they looked around and they discovered, rediscovered uh, Augustine. So Augustine became the primary the, uh, theological and philosophical antecedent for Protestantism, and Aquinas became that for the Catholic Church, right? Because, I mean, and they're both great. Uh, again, if you didn't read anybody else ever but Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, you'd be good. Okay. Uh, now, virtue theory is developed extensively in uh, St. Thomas's uh, Summa Theologica, the sum of all theology, is what that means. It gives you an idea. Uh, in the 13th century. Now, even though I, I told you that virtue, virtue ethics and deontology and teleology are not contradictory to one another, that you can actually use parts of all of them, although they are the primary approaches you can take. Um, Aquinas was primarily a deontologist. He focused on natural law, that there was a law that was originated in God's eternal law, became manifest in the natural law, which was present in all things, that there were certain ways that they were supposed to be. Whether you're a person, or a gazelle, or a river, or a tree, God had embedded. So any questions about the cardinal virtues, or theological virtues, or any of that? Again, all of these in the Christian church have been called the Christian cardinal virtues, although the first four of them were the cardinal virtues of the ancient Greek philosophers, okay? Um, let's talk about some criticisms of virtue ethics, some of the things that people have had problems with. And you might say, well, why are they criticizing virtue ethics and not deontology or teleology? Well, the reason is because deontology and teleology have been much more common leading up to modern times. As I say, it's only been since the late 50s, 1950s, that virtue ethics has come back into vogue. Well, in the process, there have been, you know, people have been shooting at it more because it hasn't been, it hasn't been around as much. So there are a number of different things that people have taken as criticisms of virtue ethics. Um, and let's talk about that. One is what's called the justification problem. And that is, which virtues should be included and why those virtues and not others? We talk about the seven cardinal virtues. We talk about virtues being sort of embodied in a person so that they, are a, they have virtuous character. Well, which virtues? Because there, you know, there are a lot of them you could come up with. Which ones seem to have the priority? This is something that has been one of the criticism. In, in fact, it sort of reflects the largest criticism of virtue ethics, and that is it's harder to nail down than perhaps, you know, like goal ethics, consequentialism. They, they talk in terms of what is going to be the best good for the most people. Well, then they get into problems as, how do you know it's going to be that? How do you predict the future? and what constitutes good, and which people. I mean, they all have challenges to them. But in particularly in virtue ethics, they say it's harder to nail down. Deontology has been very popular because they say, okay, if there's a set of rules, you can write them down. Okay. It's also been, uh, virtue ethics has been criticized because it is culturally relative, meaning there may be changes that occur with cultures. And I'll give you an example of that. You know, we say that there's certain values, certain virtues that are true in all people everywhere. You know, like it's a good idea to tell the truth. Honesty is a good virtue. But it wasn't very long ago in Western culture where submissiveness was considered a virtue for women. Right? Obedience used to be part of our marriage vows. You know, to love, honor, and obey. We don't do that anymore. Not, not if we've got our head screwed on straight. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, the, there are cultural changes that do affect what we perceive as being virtues. Not the basic ones, you know, the cardinal virtues. People still have a, a very good idea that being, being courageous and prudent and temperate, etc., that those are valuable things. But with regard to, depending upon the first question, the justification uh, problem, which virtues you include, those virtues, there may be some changes culturally as you go along. And related to that, there may be chronological relativity. What were virtues at one time are not virtues now. That's probably a better application of the of the, the, the idea about women, and what's virtuous in a woman. Um, but interestingly enough, if you go back to the virtuous woman uh, that we have in Proverbs, 
if the last chapter of Proverbs, she sounds like a very modern woman. She runs her own business. She, you know, everything else. So uh, maybe the, it's, a, it's our cultural problem, not, not an ancient one. So, so the, the issue of uh, relativity. And again, I think part of that is because of the, the idea that, or the fact that virtue ethics has, has sort of reoccurred. It's come back, and so we haven't nailed down the corners as well as we have on some of the other ethical approaches. There's also the question of what's called non-codifiability. That is that the virtues don't address directly, nor do they even necessarily lead to moral action. Remember that virtue ethics has to do with the kind of person you are. The idea being that if you're the right kind of person, a virtuous person, if you've embodied these virtues in yourself, that that will help you make the right moral decision. But within virtue ethics as a system, there is no direct connection between that and what's a moral action. It says that courage is a virtue. But it doesn't specifically say how you act in a, situ in a specific situation. The assumption is that if, if you're truly a, a virtuous person, if you have a virtue ethic embedded in your character, then you'll make the right choices. But there's no code. There's no sense in which, what do I do in a specific circumstance? So when you get down to, to practical ethics, some people say there's a disconnect between the normative ethic approach that is virtue ethics and practical ethics. All right? And it's hard to be able to define that. It, it's very subjective, isn't it? Well, and again, and one of the reasons I think it's subjective is because it's still fairly new. Like it's only been around, sort of rediscovered, 60 years ago or so. And then, um, who makes the objective decision about whether you have been moral or not? Right. And that's, I mean, that, that would come under non-codifiability as well. It's very <laughs> difficult. And so, your, your comment, Lindy, is correct. That's one way of saying what these guys, are, some of the critics are saying, and that is, it seems awfully subjective. Mm -hmm. how, and, and, it's, and there's no clear way in which you can see how that gets worked out so that everybody can say, well, it's not just subjective. There really is an objective kind of applicability to it. Um, it's also been criticized because of the idea, some people have said virtue ethics may not be different from, or even may not add anything to either teleological or deontological ethics. In other words, if you are a deontological ethicist, you believe there are rules you should follow, you believe you have duties to certain things, well, the fact that you're aware of that means you must have some sort of character virtue. There has to be some virtue ethic inherent in you, or you wouldn't feel a responsibility to do your duty. You see my point? In fact, it's true that Kant, who was an ontologist primarily, he talked, he, Kant said, as we've talked previously, when we talked about deontology, Kant said that the only ethical or moral decision that is worth anything is one that's done out of a sense of duty. He talked about the categorical imperatives, meaning that there are certain kinds of duty responsibilities that you have that it would be irrational not to do certain things, to tell the truth. It'd be irrational not to be honest because if, if, if you were, you know, how many people would have to run around being dishonest on a regular basis before society didn't work anymore? So it's irrational not to be honest. That's a categorical imperative. You don't have to justify it. It's, it's, everybody has to obey that or it would be, irrationality would run rampant. Well, when Kant developed his ontology, uh, his ethical ontology, his, and his categorical imperatives, his primary document in which he did that was called the Doctrine of Virtue, which is a good example of the fact that the consideration of what is virtuous and whether or not we are obedient to our duty or even whether or not we really are taking into account the best good for the most people, isn't there some virtue inherent in the fact that's a concern of ours? Doing the most good for the uh, best good for the most people? So some people have claimed that virtue ethics is redundant, that it's not nearly, it's, it's not its own system, it simply is something that's underlying the other approaches to normative ethics. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then some have simply said that virtue ethics may be practically unrealistic. It, we may be trying to develop what's, what they, has been referred to as uns, an, unsustainable, an unsustainable utopia. In other words, expecting that people are going to be good, that they're going to be moral in the way that Aristotle described them, that they're going to have such, such a, an embodiment of ethical <laughs> virtues in their character, that they're always going to make the right choice? Give me a break. Have you looked around at people? Have you paid attention to how people act? Well, a virtue ethicist would say, well, that's because they're not really practicing this. You know, they, they, they're not being trained in, in virtue 
morality, virtue ethics. They're not developing moral character in the way that you would have to as Aristotle. Again, Aristotle said this takes a lifetime because you first have to become, not just know what the virtues are, but you have to be so much immersed in them, they become who you are. And then, as you experience life, you have to have those moral virtues. Um, you have to have the, the practical wisdom to be able to understand how those virtues then get applied. And that takes a long time. Well, other people have said, we don't have that much time. Okay? <laughs> it's not like I can wait till I'm you know, at the deathbed and say, okay, now I've learned enough to make good ethical decisions. I've got to make ethical decisions right now. And so that's been one of the challenges. All right? Questions about that? Yeah, here, here first. No, John first. I'm going in alphabetical order. You know, uh, I, I, I cannot remember the two authors of the big book that we have for this class. But that book, those authors, if what I've read is correct, they would make the argument that these criticisms are, are very valid if the basis and the fountain of your ethical center is based on these philosophies. Mm -hmm. However, their encouragement would be that as Christians, our basis for ethical behavior and virtues are based on Christ and the scriptures, and they draw a very clear argument for that. Now, one would say, well, how can you accept the word? Well, we're, we, don't, we don't accept the word because we can prove it. We accept the word because by faith. So for me, as a Christian, that sets me on course where I'm not in the waves of doubt and wondering, and, well, is this right? I, I, no, right. I, I mean, it's, it's, these arguments are valid. But for a Christian whose ethical center is based on Scripture, I find a lot of peace in that. Yes. You know, and some people call that bigotry. I just call it simple faith, just, you know kind of reduces the waves of, of confusion and right. helps me orient and navigate this life in a way that I would hope would please Jesus. Right. Well, and in effect, <clears throat> um, and I'm going to talk about this next week, I'm going to sort of draw it sort of back around to as we as Christians, since this is a class in Christian ethics, but we have to sort of understand because Christian ethics interacts with all these things as well. Sure. But the idea that um, what happens for us is the model that Jesus and the other apostles as well, because you know we are an apostolic church. Christianity is based upon what Jesus taught the apostles and how they then pass that on to us. The model of Jesus and the apostles becomes for us an external affirming source. Now, I say that because even before Jesus, a lot of these things were the virtues, the cardinal virtues of the Greeks, they all existed, and the church has adopted them and said those are absolutely consistent with what we believe that Jesus taught us and that Paul taught us and that, you know, it's part of what our faith is all about. But for us, it's not just a matter of pursuing the philosophy. We do have an external affirmation, external to ourselves. It's not just our logic. It's not just our philosophy, our rationalizing. It's not just even our life experience. We have a source outside ourselves that says these things are good. This is right. This is consistent with what God desires for us. This is how we were made to be, which is exactly what you're saying. That really anchors me. Exactly. That really anchors me. It's not just up to me and whether I get it right or wrong. I mean, one of the, the, the greatest uh, reassurances that I have in life is that if I, if I succeed or if I fail, it's not just up to me. If I preach a good sermon or a bad sermon, I have a responsibility to do the best I can. But if I have done the best I can, it's no longer up to me. Beyond that, it is of God. And the same thing is true with everything else in Christian life. Well, part of that is because we have the external, if you will, objective testimony of Scripture to tell us how we are supposed to proceed and pursue this thing, and that is Christian life, and ethical decisions and everything else. And so we have the assurance that it isn't just up to us, and that makes a huge difference. Marvin? The criticism can go both ways. I think we should embrace it and say, okay, now we have some possible problems here, we have some ways to think about this and improve it, or you know, the other way is to say, well, it's garbage, it's no use, it's no good, just, just throw it all away. You know, but we should embrace criticism because that will help us to become stronger and smarter and so on. Right, exactly, and I think that's true. And uh, some people have said, 
We can apply some of the same or very similar kinds of uh, objections and criticisms to teleology or ontology. And in fact, in those cases, I think when we do look at those classes, I gave you some ideas. Teleology, for instance, <clears throat> to a great extent is trying to predict the future. You know, you're making, if, if you're a consequentialist, you're making ethical decisions based upon what the consequences will be, and you're trying to get the, the best good for the most people, then you're trying to predict the future, and how good are we at that? And there's a, there are inherent problems with all of these systems. Maybe it's more than predict, actually control the future. Right. If we can do all, get together and do this, then we will make this happen. And, and there's, I'll give you an example that just happened in the news. And I, I'm not saying this as a political evaluation, but a reporter asked uh, Jeb Bush, and again, this is not a, you know, this is not a Democrat or Republican kind of thing. It's just an example of, of teleological ethics that I heard. The, the reporter asked Jeb Bush, if you were alive back in the time when, when Adolf Hitler was a baby, would you kill the baby that was Adolf Hitler? And Jeb Bush said, yeah, you're damn right I would, you know. Um, really? And you're absolutely sure that if you killed the baby Adolf Hitler, you know, you're okay with killing a baby first, and if you kill the baby Adolf Hitler, how do you know that somebody even worse might not have come along? How do you know that, that all of the things that led to the rise of Hitler might not have led to the rise of somebody even worse? And it's hard for us to imagine somebody worse than Hitler, but I can imagine people worse than Hitler. Paul Pot, for instance who killed, what was it, a third of the population of his country, indiscriminately. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the teleological question there is, are you so quick to say, you're damn right I would, when you don't know what the consequences really would have been of that? Never mind the question of what kind of virtue would it be to kill an infant before the infant has actually done anything wrong. You know, there were a few hours there on... Monday morning and Tuesday morning when I wanted to eat our puppies. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, a little sauce, much better than getting up every hour, hour and a half in the middle of the night. They're not doing that anymore, so it's great. But, um, you know, to recognize that making a decision then, if I had, if I had done it, if I'd taken them back, then without knowing what was going to happen in two days or three days and how they're going to change, I couldn't predict the future. What's happening now does not give you a clear indication of what's going to happen then. Killing a baby because of what that baby might become. You, you, you guys know the movie, and there's now a TV show, Minority Report. Minority Report, they had three, uh, it was a, a Tom Cruise movie. Um, and Minority Report was they had three people who were psychic, and these psychic people could um, look into the future and tell who was going to commit a murder. Well, the authorities started arresting people and imprisoning them because of what they were going to do. The, the, the title Minority Report was that uh, many times one of those three psychics would have a different view. They would have a minority report of what was going to happen. It might not be that that person's going to commit a murder. And so Minority Report, the whole point was, you don't really know. And they ended up getting rid of that program, and the TV show is like after they got rid of the program and those people grew up, but they're still psychic, and what does that all mean? Um, but that's a perfect teleological example. Even if two out of three people have the supposedly the absolute ability to know if somebody's going to commit a murder, you still don't know it for sure. And so you're predicting the future. Do you take an, and make an, a moral decision? Do you arrest somebody and put them in prison for the rest of their life because they might have been going to kill somebody? You see? That's consequentialism. And yet, you, you can see from that how very difficult it is for that to work. Okay. Um, any, any more questions about this? Yeah, I mentioned to you that, that the, the list of vices is infinitely longer than the possible list of virtues. And, and one article I was looking at, or one um, text, they said, you know, we can talk about being irresponsible, feckless, lazy, inconsiderate, uncooperative, harsh, intolerant, selfish, mercenary, indiscreet, tactless, arrogant, unsympathetic, cold, incautious, unenterprising, pusillanimous, feeble, presumptuous, rude, hypocritical, self-indulgent, materialistic, grasping, short-sighted, vindictive, calculating, ungrateful, grudging, brutal, profligate, disloyal, and on and on. All right? So the, the relative list of virtues is quite short. <laughs> Uh, but there's still a question as to, okay, but which ones are you going to focus on? Which ones are going to be the real 
emphasis if you're talking about this as a basis for an ethical system. Um, so what's, what are the future directions of virtue ethics? Now, we don't ask that question about teleology and deontology because they didn't go into suspended animation for three to four hundred years like virtue ethics did. And that's why virtue ethics is always listed last. Um, there is there are still a lot of gaps. For instance, I'll get into this, there are areas of ethical consideration like some of the very modern ones, the ethics of environment, ethics of biology or biotechnology, ethics of business. There, no work has been done yet on applying virtue ethics to those things. So when they're trying to put together text to consider the ethical issues, they're struggling because there's one of the three major ways of looking at ethics that they, it's not developed enough for them to be able to apply it. All of those things have the ethical questions related to biotechnology, for instance. You know, cloning and stem cell research and all of that has occurred during the time when virtue ethics was in stasis and they haven't yet figured out. Nobody has yet done the work and done the writing to figure out how that applies. And so there are big holes, whereas deontology and teleology have been sort of in there cranking the whole time. So first, recent approaches to virtue ethics, in term, and we're talking about future direction, have included non-Aristotelian forms, um, particularly agent-based versus agent-focused, which, struggle as I might, I have difficulty really understanding what that means. <laughs> um, the idea that agent-focused is talking about the, the virtues of the person, <clears throat> you know, the object, the agent that we're talking about, because all of these are are subjective in the sense that there is somebody who's, who is manifesting these virtues versus being based in the agent but still sort of connected to actions. Um, my understanding of this is the non-Aristotelian forms that are fairly modern and particularly um, a fellow named Michael Sloat has focused on this agent-based approach. It's dealing with the virtues a person has but it's also taking it a step further unlike Aristotle and beginning to say how does that manifest itself, how does it work out. So it's not just um, agent-focused, it's agent-based, meaning it's based there, but then it begins to manifest itself. Does that make sense? That's the best I can figure it out. Um, so, and some people have looked at Sloat's work and go, okay, you're going way too far in trying to draw a difference here. There also has been a growing interest in ancient <laughs> Chinese and other non-Western ethics. I mentioned that earlier, that in Confucianism, Confucianism has a lot to do with duty, which is uh, ontological, but it has to do with developing a moral character as well. And so there's, been, there's more, and this is fairly young. For the most part, the work that's been done in non-Western ethics, what they've done is they've looked at, at Chinese and other non-Western ethics, and then they've applied the Western criteria to it. So it's actually just Western ethics with a, you know, Western virtue ethics with the additional information that they get from the Far East. But they're beginning now to consider it as an independent thing not just taking Aristotelian and post-Aristotelian ethics and trying to apply it back to a non-Western uh, situation. Um, despite remarkable growth in recent decades, and this is what I was just talking about, virtue ethics is still much in the minority, especially in the area of applied ethics. There's not nearly as much work that's been done on this since it was in, you know, it was in a dark hole between the Renaissance and the 19, late 1950s. There is a prediction that there will be a great deal of growth in the next few years, especially in the ethics of environment and business, biotechnology, etc. Things that ethical issues came along in those, primarily since virtue ethics went into stasis. And so they're still doing that. I mean, there, there are accounts of people who have wanted to do anthologies of essays on topics like bioethical considerations. And they can't find anything that's been written from a virtue ethics perspective. They want to represent the three major streams of normative ethics, deontology, teleology, and, and, and radiology. And they can't find anything that's been written on those topics in this. So a lot of work still has to be done. Um, there is serious doubt, however, as to whether or not there will ever be a virtue ethics of politics. <laughs> um, Amen. The idea Amen. that applying, applying the idea of virtuous... Now, that's not to say that all, no politicians have virtue. <laughs> But providing a systematic kind of approach to writing virtue ethics as a politics virtue ethics, um, everybody's sort of scratching their head and saying they don't really know how that's going to work. Now, it is true that much of what Aristotle wrote had to do with virtue ethics, ethics as applied to the polis, which is where we get the word you know, politics, polis being the city and leadership in a city. 
but their, their situation, their environment was far from being the sort of uh, Democratic Republic kind of thing that we're looking at in the West. And so nobody's quite figured out yet whether or not it's possible or whether they will be able to apply virtue ethics into a, a Western political kind of consideration. Mark. I think politicians are in a very difficult position. They have to get elected. And then they are supposed to do what's best for everyone. Right. However, if you do what's best for everyone, you probably will not get elected again. So it's almost an impossible. Yeah, it's a catch twenty two. Yeah. Um, and in that's why the idea of an elected re elected representational government is the worst idea anybody ever came up with, and it's the best system of government we've ever created. Yeah. <clears throat> There's no question that there there. Built into that system, there is an inherent motivation to graft. Absolutely. I mean, graft of some kind. I don't mean making money necessarily, but in doing, trying to satisfy other people's expectations in order to be able to continue doing what you're doing, even if you have the most noble of aspirations. It is very, very difficult. That's what said. polls are. Polls just let you know how, how well you're feeling to, to all the Exactly, answers. and that's why polling is so important, you know, and um, yeah. So that's a, that's a question as to whether or not they're going to be able to extend virtue ethics into the area of politics. Um, I'll share a, yeah. I'd like to just share a, a, a something that I heard. <coughs> All of you know my driver and friend Samuel. Talked about Christian ethics about ten days ago. He has, he and two relatives have the body and paint shop business. They really needed the business, and an American whom we didn't know came with a car that needed work and they were closing the deal at 16,000 pesos. Then the American said to him, the only thing is you have to lie to my insurance company. I want a receipt for 20, I think it was 24,000 pesos. And Samuel said, I can't do that. He said, well, why not? He said, because of my religious principles. And Crazy. he said, well, you're Catholic, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I am a Christian and I can't take your business. Good. Good. Isn't that a nice That's great. Story? The assumption that Catholics are more ready to lie about things is kind of a weird thing. But yeah, I, I think that's a great story. Good for him. Yeah, good. Um, and then, as virtue ethics has always emphasized the importance of moral education, and again, from Aristotle on, the idea is that we need to train people in this, that they then have to, they have to have an understanding, they have to have training in it, they have to be educated in it, and then they have to begin to experience in their life. Um, that there is now a growing movement toward virtue education. Now, it used to be, even though virtue ethics as a, nor, as a branch of normative ethics was not popular, in the West, there has always been a sense in which there was a, a moral aspect to our general education. You know, we tried to raise kids to say, you, know, you don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal. Um, and yet, that has not been the emphasis in recent re years. And in fact, there is, it's recognized, this isn't just my opinion, that we have a lot of young people today that grow up saying, well, why not if it gives me an advantage? Why shouldn't I do that? If I can, you know, if I'll make more money or not have to work as hard or whatever. Because we have not had, even though we didn't call it virtue ethics, we've not had a kind of systematic approach to that. We have seen the damage that is caused by not having, um, whether a philosophical approach, but just a practical approach, to teaching the advantage of certain virtues. Well, with the rebirth of virtue ethics, there has become a much greater emphasis on developing school focus, <coughs> training, you know, academic emphasis on teaching virtue ethics and teaching the advantage of inculcating virtues into our character and becoming a person of virtue in the hope and expectation that, as Aristotle said, that then will be lived out as we have practical experience in how we make our moral decisions. Um, so there is much, much movement in that direction in terms of the, the development of uh, ethical education. Yes? Do we see that happening more and more as um, a return to our past? Because our, our Jewish friends have um, had moral issues as part of their education from the beginnings of time. Uh, you know, they were taught to read and write and to have a responsibility because they had those abilities. 
and to um, be responsible to God, not to kings or um, even to the priests of their church, which is one of the reasons why Jesus hopped up and down and showed, you know, you guys have got it all wrong. Um, and then, and so you know I was over uh, to Morocco, which is a totally Muslim country, and there, um, they're talking a lot about ethics and, and morals and um, in government, etc., etc. And yet they have a law that says you cannot speak out against the king. It is a very severe criminal offense. Right. And we asked this question of a professor, an 85-year-old man who's very intelligent, said <coughs> the king has businesses, commercial enterprises, and one of them is a cement business, and, and he's promoting all this building of new buildings, and we build like we do with all the cement, etc. So is that not a conflict of interest? And she had the thought this PhD, and she tried this approach and that approach, and we kept saying that's not an answer to the question asked. And finally, she, uh, we were told just don't ask him more. Yeah, because you could really get somebody in trouble if you push them on that. Yes, exactly. Which, and when we got on the bus and we're driving down the road where nobody else could be part of our conversation, our escort explained that yeah. you were endangering that woman yep. with your insistence on the correct answer to the question. And although she may, may have thought the way we did, she was not able to express right. that. So are we as North Americans, um, <coughs> meaning Mexico, Canadians, and Americans, not sort of trying to develop in that general direction? Or are we just sort of floating around doing our own thing with our education of young people and uh, with what we expect of politicians? Um. I don't know exactly how to answer the question. The, it, this is not just a North American issue. This no, is, no, yeah. no, it's, it's, it's a global phenomenon in some places. Right. Now, in Muslim countries, there, there is, Muslim countries would be a good example where deontology and virtue ethics are interwoven <coughs> because the, you know, the writings, the Quran, the hadith, which are uh, the hadith and the, the writings of the, the experiences, the words of, of Muhammad, the uh, practical application of, of, of the Islamic faith to his life, you know, Muhammad's words and actions are considered uh, minimally secondary to <coughs> itself. So there is a sense in which the virtue that is manifest, that is represented in uh, Muhammad, they believe, is, is a kind of virtue ethics that they want to replicate. But then ultimately, Islam is a deontological religion in that there are very, very clear and very strict rules that you do and don't do. And one of the things you don't do is you don't criticize the people that have been put in charge because it's believed that God put those people in charge. So that's one of the reasons you see that in Islamic countries. Um, the, so yeah, I, I think that having absolute rules as a deontological or a government, which would be a Muslim country, but also believing that there are certain virtues that particularly are manifest in the person of Muhammad that they want to replicate is a, is a they struggle with those things as well. They tend, if they have to choose though, they'll clearly lean on the side of being law oriented, you know, duty oriented. Sure. Um, this last point is really, uh, I think, very important because in one of your lectures and in some of the reading, the point was made that character is developed very strongly by the community that the person is raised in. Yeah. Okay. And if that character allows, you know, says, I mean, if that community says it's okay, you can steal that, um, or you can lie there, or you can do that. That's what really has the influence on the formation of character of young people. And it does not counterbalance by a serious teaching of virtue ethics. Um, and I would suggest, based on, on what we see in scripture, then you have a people who, who, who like we've seen here, you know, and if, if, if this is available and it's not mine, well, it's, it's in my country, it's mine, 
you know, and there's this formation of character that I, I'm appalled because I see many Christians here even lie, fib, uh, steal, and be completely justified. And I, it's always bothered me, because I've lived here a long time, it's always bothered me. And that comment about how our character is formed basically by our society really answered that. If that's the case, then this is vital. vital yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, um, and there are examples like that. The number of Christians that have told me that they'll pay more DDA if they get pulled over on a parking ticket or on a uh, you know, speeding ticket or whatever. Um, I absolutely don't, and I will never. Um, absolutely not. They can impound my car, they can take it away from me, they can put me in jail. I am not going to pay a bribe because I don't believe that's right. And when I've said that to people, they go, oh, but you know, they can really cause problems for you. Yeah, well, okay, life's full of problems. It doesn't mean I'm going to, I am not going to do something I believe to be wrong, dishonest, in order to keep myself from having some problem. And I don't think any of us as Christians should. Um, there are some extraordinary, some extreme examples of this question of um, the effect of upbringing on people in terms of their ability to know what's morally right and wrong. Are you familiar with the Sawney Bean family? It was a family in England in, I think it was the 18th century, I think it was the 1700s. This, a man and woman, his name was Sonny Bean, um, they were both horrible people. They were highway uh, robbers, highwaymen. They would, you know, stick up um, people who were traveling by coach or horse along the road and, and, and kill them and take all of their stuff. And then, you know, he would go and sneak into a village or something and sell the horse or sell the jewels or whatever they got. Well, that's bad enough, but... <laughs> They lived out in the country. In fact, they found that there was a cave that during the, during the high tide, which was most of the time, the mouth of the cave was covered. You entered it by the beach. And so over years and years and years when they tried to catch these people, they couldn't find them because they were in this cave that the, the entrance was covered most of the time. Well, they had like 12 kids. And they raised those kids to be highwaymen. Worse than that. They didn't, you know, after they had all these kids and they didn't want to go into town to buy stuff, they decided we really need a protein source, so they started eating the people that they would rob and kill. And they raised these children as cannibals. This is in England now. Um, and raised them to believe that it was perfectly appropriate to kill people and eat them and to steal their goods and to sell those goods. You know, And this is an extreme example because eventually they caught these people. And the father and mother, Sonny Bean and his wife, were executed. But even in the, even in the, the 18th century, they, there was a real puzzle. What do we do with these kids? They, have never, they were taught this was fine. They were taught this was normal. They had no way of knowing anything any different than this. Um, so the idea of upbringing, the effect that that has on people, and much of what I think the final conclusion was is that some of the smaller ones, you know, were not old enough to be able to make moral decisions anyway. But some of the older ones, they felt like at some point should have had some sense that killing people was not a good idea, and so some of them were imprisoned or whatever. They had different things they did to different ones of them. But it was a real question. Mm -hmm. Sawney Bean, S-A-W-N-E-Y, B-E-A-N-E. Wait, 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 S-A-W-N-E-Y. Sawney, S-A-W-N-E-Y. Last name, B-E-A-N-E, Sawney Bean. Um, and so, and there have been other examples where, where especially children were born and reared in a certain kind of environment, and, and what, to how much impact does that have on any concept they have of what is, what is virtuous, what is morally right or wrong? So we have a lot of very practical kinds of historic considerations. On that. The flip side of that is what we're talking about here, and that is if we want people to grow up moral, part of it is that we have a responsibility as parents, as communities as a culture to try to identify and inculcate those kinds of virtues in people. All right? I didn't tell you that story to just be lurid, but it is considered one of the most, you know, most extraordinary case studies on one on justice, you know, how do you how do you provide justice in a situation like that for children who grew up not knowing any different, but then also on the effect of, you know, uh, the raising of children and the effect that it has on them, okay? Um, I was thinking we might spend a little time, and we're almost out of time, going over the, the questions on the Christian ethics. I think it's pretty straightforward. One of, one of the reasons, I, because we didn't spend a lot of time, or I didn't give you as much time, and I'm feeling kind of guilty about that, I'll be honest. 
Um, there is a lot of detail on these notes, and I give you these notes for two reasons. One is so, if you're taking the test, and I encourage you to, even if you're not doing this for credit, because you'll learn more. One is so that you have the information for, that you need for taking the test, and there will not be anything on the test that's not on this document. But secondly, whether you take the test or not, this is a summary of everything we've pretty much studied in here, and so this becomes, it's sort of a mini course on everything we've done without having to listen to me drone on and on. So when you get into, uh, into this and you'll read an enormous amount of detail, if you're taking the test, you can be assured, most of you have taken my test before, I don't go into such detail that, for instance, if I ask you a question and there's quite a bit of detail on it, it's all multiple choice, okay? You'll usually get four options. So you don't have to remember all this stuff in order to be able to fill in the blank. You don't have to write essay questions. If there's a lot of detail on this stuff, you only need to know it well enough to be able to recognize it anyway. And I'm not going to give you a lot of detail that I don't think is important, but on this document, because I want this to be a summary of the course, there is a lot more detail than what I'll try to put into the test. In fact, there's 55, I think 50, yeah, 55 <coughs> questions here. We'll, we'll only have 50 questions, and it won't cover all of this stuff. So don't panic when you get into this. It is intentionally more. But everything is multiple choice if you take the test. All you have to do is to be able to recognize it. And none of this is not some, all of this is stuff we've gone over in class. And you've seen the PowerPoints, most of it's taken from the PowerPoints. Um, any questions about that? I don't think anybody accuses me of making unfair tests, do, do they? <laughs> Particularly since I tell you everything that's on. Um, okay, well our time is pretty much up. Thank you all very much. Um, if you have any questions on this, in the meantime, feel free to email me or even give me a call. Email's better. Um, and um, I'll see you next week.